Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Regenerated Radio, episode five of season three. I got it right this time. Episode five of season three. I'm so honored to have with me today Dr. Richard Barcelos, uh, who a lot of you guys have requested. Many people have said, oh, you need to get Dr. Barcelos on. Uh, you can talk about hermeneutics, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, before we get to it, though, just a couple of quick notes for housekeeping, things that you might need to keep up with. Um, first and foremost... If you haven't been following, if you if you are on YouTube right now and you're checking this out and you're not subscribed to me, definitely subscribe because I'm not just doing the podcast. I do drop the podcast on here, obviously, first because I'm doing it live through YouTube. And then I go and I rip the audio and I put it onto Anchor and it spreads out to all the, spot, uh, the podcasting platforms, which is really helpful. Uh, but for the most part, what you're going to see on the YouTube channel is not just the podcast. You're going to have some other things on there. As in right now, I'm going through uh, the 1689 London Baptist Confession chapter by chapter in 30-minute video ish and just trying to give my own sort of exposition on it uh, informed by the many men who have um, you know poured into me through seminary and through books that I've read and so forth so hopefully that will be helpful to some people but definitely check it out uh, that's on the YouTube channel as well other things to, to note would be um, obviously Instagram and Facebook I've started up those accounts so you guys can keep up with that with what what's happening as well uh, and then there's the regenerated design stores where you can pick up shirts and different designs that I'm trying to make and that's all more or less stuff that I've been doing for fun. No obligation for you guys to do any of those things, but definitely uh, hit the subscribe and like button so this video can get out to more people and that more people can understand what good hermeneutics are. So I'm really excited about that. A uh, quick note before I actually bring Dr. Barcelos on, I can't bring him on uh, in the video like I generally would. Unfortunately, video is not going to be an option for us today, but that's okay. So you're just going to have to be stuck looking at my face the whole day. Uh, if you're listening on Anchor, it's not a problem for you anyway. <laughs> so no big deal. Uh, so before we... Uh, before we go any further, let me just introduce Dr. Richard Barcelos. Welcome. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. All right. Well, let me go ahead and pray for us so that we can have a good conversation. And then once we are done praying, we'll jump in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this technology and uh, the time that you've allowed for us to be able to come together at a great distance and discuss things that God, that I've been learning. I thank you for the work of Dr. Barcelos and that, uh, that he, the things that I've been able to learn uh, and to grow in my understanding of your word. And God, I pray that that would be reflected in our talking today, the things that we talk about today. Uh, God, would you be glorified in our conversation? Um, if we say things that are inaccurate, God, would you uh, would you in your spirit just help those things to pass over the ears of the listeners? But God, would, we pray that it would be glorifying to you and that it would be honoring to you, Lord, as we continue this discussion today. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who allows us to come before your throne with boldness and with the expectation that you will answer our prayers. God, we love you and we love your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Dr. Marcellus, could you tell us a little bit about who you are? Bef actually, before you do, a couple of quick things. I do have some of his books here, so I will plug some of those shortly. So, if you, But go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, um, so forth. Um, yes, I am a son of my parents, <laughs> brother of my brothers, um, husband of my wife, father of my five children, and grandfather of three and one on the way. I'm also um, pastor, Grace Reformed Baptist Church, Palmdale, California. Um, I also am a visiting, I think, professor at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary and an associate professor at IRBS Theological Seminary. Uh, degrees okay i have a i have an, a bachelor's of science in agricultural business california state university of fresno hmm. mdiv master seminary thm phd whitfield uh, i also edit the um, irbs theological journal and um I used to mow my lawn, but my son mows it now. <laughs> I'm waiting for that day. <laughs> that sounds great. So uh, I know you also, for a while, you were working on a project. You had the Reformed Baptist Academic Press. Um, do you want to speak about that at all? I know that maybe it's not active right now. I'm not too, too sure about the status of all that. Yeah. Yeah, it still, uh, still exists. Uh, the, the website crashed, and I'm ah, getting gotcha. a new That's one built. <laughs> But yeah, we we have we have that rbap.net, and um, 
um, there was a journal actually that st was started in 2004. I did that for, I think, 11 years. I'm not sure. And then it just, it was too hard to maintain. And mm -hmm. so um, three or four years later, after I had moved back from Kentucky to California, Dr. Rana, James Rana and I were texting one another and we basically said the same thing. We, we need to start a journal. So we start, I started a new one. Um, and then the books you mentioned, I write books every once in a while. And, but my main, main calling is to, uh, is to pastor my sheep. And I, I consider that my most important thing that I do Amen. Um, is a minister of the gospel to my people. I love that attitude. And I love that. That's one of the things that I love about CBTS. Um, and I know IRBS is the same way. Just the, the staff and everyone is very pastorally focused uh, and showing that that's the most important thing that you can do. A couple of quick things about those books, though. One, I have them. a couple of them here that I'll sort of plug for you. One is Getting the Garden Right. Uh, and this is, I love the subtitle of this, Adam's Work and God's Rest in Light of Christ. And I'm sure some of those themes will pop up in our conversation a little bit today. This was very influential. And in when I was kind of struggling back and forth with what does it mean to really keep the Sabbath and, you know, how, what does that look like? So very helpful. Uh, along with In Defense of the Decalogue is another book that Dr. Barcelos has written. It's a little bit harder to get your hands on, so I don't have that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and then Recovering a Covenantal Heritage, which is a really cool uh, collection of essays from some Reformed Baptists that have uh, just covered a, a series of, of ideas and topics in covenant theology, Baptist covenant theology particularly. Uh, definitely something to check on as well, and that was given to me a few if you guys have been watching for a while, you saw my box opening. Uh, so I was, I was kind of gifted that book. And I was really glad that I got it because it was very helpful and influential for me as well. So well, that sounds good. Is, are you working on any other books right now? Anything else that's coming in the pipeline? Um, that you can well, share my last, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my last book was uh, Trinity and Creation. Right. And I think it came out in 2000. 20 or 21 mm -hmm. and that took a lot of work it took me years to get it all together and so that kind of got me tired of writing so i kind of taken a little break but i did contribute uh, a chapter to a book that matthew barrett is editing it's on the trinity trying to kind of retrieve a nicene um hermeneutic and theological method uh, as it relates to the Trinity. And so I, I don't know when that's coming out. I, it was supposed to come out early this year. I doubt that's going to happen, hmm. but it's got like 30, 30 or 32 contributors and they're all over the ecclesiastical map. Um, so I had that, um, that was due last year and I got it into them. And then I have other, uh, the master seminary journal. They published a, an article by me, actually two, one on this, current issue and then about a year ago or so they did another one yeah i saw that i saw that journal coming out and then i'm, I'm looking forward to that book um i know there's a lot of trinity issues coming out right now and that may be something i'll have to cover at some point <laughs> i do have a just finished a video on uh the second chapter of the london confession so certainly you can check that out if you're listening uh although definitely don't listen to me first listen to these guys they're way smarter than i am well, that's great. Uh, thanks for sharing all that. And I'm excited to kind of jump through with the rest of this. So let's just kind of get into the conversation of biblical hermeneutics. And when I first approached you, I talked about uh, maybe we could talk about the theological interpretation of scripture, but I thought we can kind of more broadly speak to hermeneutics and have that baked into it. So um, first and foremost, if, if you could just give us a quick definition of like, what are hermeneutics broadly speaking? Yeah, I noticed in my lecture notes, I had this brief definition and then i have a footnote to louise burkoff mm -hmm. principles of biblical interpretation but it's not quoted so maybe it, it's burkoff's words or just me borrowing him but uh, generally speaking hermeneutics would involve the principles that we apply to the interpretation uh, of all kinds of either uh, communication either verbal or written so principles of interpretation the science of interpretation they say Mm -hmm. And then I guess we break that further down into the ideas of what hermeneutica sacra, right? Sacred hermeneutics. And so how, how is that different, yeah. I guess, than like... Yes, yeah, so some people do that. Um, 
Burkhoff does it, for instance, general hermeneutics principles applied to the interpretation of all kinds of, we'll just stick to writings. Um, uh, and then sacred hermeneutics would be, uh, would involve principles derived from the scripture in terms of how it interprets itself. So those would be divinely inspired principles of interpretation. And there's, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, overlap between the two, because for instance, you'll hear Christian hermeneutical writers uh, make an issue of what they call intertextuality. That is, right. texts within scripture seem to engage and interact with other texts in scripture. Um, but you can take the concept of intertextuality and apply it to, you know, I've done this, John Owen, for instance. There's mm -hmm. intertextuality in Owen as well. Uh, Owen sometimes mentions, just, you know, evokes a previous writing on a certain issue. So there, that's a form of intertextuality as well. Right. Okay. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but because I, I think I got maybe some mixed signals through the lectures, but you wrote your dissertation on John Owen's, um, John Owen's theology, right? Or his hermeneutics, maybe specific, get specific on that. <laughs> I, kind of like that. The, the title is called The Family Tree of Reformed Biblical Theology. And I compared and contrasted um, Owen's work on the history of redemption uh, I think it's anachronistically called uh, biblical theology, mm -hmm. that big fat one, with uh, with Gerhardus Voss and his uh, book entitled Biblical Theology. And Voss basically defines biblical theology as, as the history of redemption, you know, encapsulated in the written word of God. And al although um, Owen didn't use the phrase biblical theology, but the concepts embodied in in um, in, in Voss's definition can be found uh, can be found in Owen as well. And, and what you do when you see their treatments of the history of redemption, you'll you'll see them make a lot of hermeneutical moves, you know. And so you go trace those down in their other writings and try to find the same principles used in other writers and you know, draw conclusions and all that stuff. So that, that's what that, that's what I did for the dissertation. That's really interesting. And I, I knew the, once you said the title of it, I, I mean, knew that was a book and I just completely, it slipped my mind, I guess, that that was actually your dissertation. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to read that at some point as well. Some of these books I really need to get my hands on saying, well, okay. So one of the things that you talk about a lot, and I think it's a, it's one of the phrases that stuck in my head and there's several to be quite frank so phrases that you used over and over again and i'm sure you did that strategically to get it in our heads but one of them was that everyone brings a presupposition to the text the idea is to bring the best possible presupposition to the text so i was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit talk about what do you mean by presupposition in that regard and then how do we uh, how do how do we bring the best presuppositions to the text yeah well how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. <laughs> that's that's a loaded question. I, I, I'm sure. Now, Sorry. <laughs> so let's try to put it, this in a uh, historical context. If you went back to the 17th century, let's say, and you asked uh, John Owen, Nehemiah Cox, uh, should we attempt to interpret the Bible as a tabula rasa, as a blank slated mind? Should we go into the laboratory of interpretation and on the way in, take off all working assumptions about reality that we have in our mind or all working assumptions that we have uh, concerning the Bible, lay them on a table and then, you know, put our white coat on and our white gloves and then go in and interpret the Bible. If you asked them that, they would say, uh, you must come from the future. <laughs> well, well now if they lived you know 400 years now they would say i lived through the enlightenment and you are asking me a question that didn't come up until well it did come up in the 17th century but uh, more so in the 18th century uh, th that is uh, man as an interpreter of either reality or we'll, we're, we're dealing with scripture. So man as an interpreter of scripture, 
should seek to rid himself of all pre-commitments or pre-judgments about anything. And, and this, this came from enlightenment philosophy, which was, uh, in this case, um, you know, natural, uh, naturalism. Um, there's no supernatural. God might exist, and he might have made everything, deism, but he's certainly not providentially active in space and time. Therefore, whatever the Bible is, it can't be the product of divine inspiration. So the Bible is to be interpreted like any other book. It's a, it's a humanly produced book. The authors had religious ideas. It's basically a history of ancient Judaism and a history of uh, primal Christianity, but it's certainly not inspired right. Uh, right. by God and therefore not infallible. So what happened was uh, a lot of Christians kind of, you know, bought into this. They were sus suspicious of assumptions being used to interpret the text. Where they just wanted to get alone in a room with me and the text. <laughs> right. Um, however, um, our assumptions come with us. For instance, if you want to be alone in the in the interpretive laboratory, just you and your Bible, how are you going to read it unless you assume? In our case, human language, in, the English language has a logic to it. It really exists. There is a form that English speakers can communicate with. And the translation I have is in that form. You know, rules of grammar and syntax and even, even, even the philosophy of words, philosophy of language and the philosophy of words, we bring it in the laboratory with it. Um, the Bible assumes that words are verbal or written signs that signify something. You know, that comes from, well, it doesn't come from Augustine, but Augustine right. spoke about that in terms of, you know, how words function. Mm -hmm. Words are signs which signify things. And we, we don't learn that from the Bible. It's illustrated all over the Bible, and it's assumed by the Bible. But it is an assumption we already bring to the text. Now, the post-modern uh, movement in terms of uh, interpreting documents uh, swung the pendulum uh, too far. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the modern era, they tried to become basically tabula rasa, loss, tabula rasa blank slate rationalists. I can just come in there in the laboratory, me and my Bible, and I can throw out all my assumptions and allow the Bible to fill me with proper assumptions for interpretation, all that stuff. Well, the postmodernists came in and said, no, everybody has presuppositions. And um, what's true to them might not be true to you. So let's hear from everybody. So then documents became like a wax nose. You know, the resurrection means um, God is for helping people who are injured or whatever. Uh, so, so, so what happened was an, an overemphasis on the assumptions and presuppositions of all readers. They became determinative of the meaning of the text. But if we went back before the Enlightenment, the guys would say, we, everybody has presuppositions. Let's try to get the right ones. Mm -hmm. So how do you get the right ones? Now, they did this in various ways, okay, um, and some of them are controversial in our, our day. But one of the things that they said is, they, they said, look, in, in the early patristics, there's this thing called the rule of faith. And right. I know it's defined in different ways and all this stuff, but at least initially, it was basically that God is one, and yet the New Testament teaches very clearly that there are pre, three persons that are God. And the New Testament also teaches that what we call Christianity is latent within the Old Testament. It's promised in the Old Testament. So this relationship between the Testaments, the unity of the divine essence, the trinity of divine persons and stuff like that. Now, that was fleshed out in creedal forms. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, very early one. And then uh, the, the biggies, I think, are, are the Nicene, 
uh, the statement of at Chalcedon and what men call the Athanasian Creed. Those are huge. So yeah. when you get when you start reading later writers, their view of this rule of faith um, broadened and included the creeds. And you can see that in the especially the post Reformation, well, the Reformation and post Reformation confessions uh, and catechisms themselves they're borrowing language from the history of theology so the, so they're assuming that those creeds got something so basic and so right uh, we need to build on their shoulders yeah you know, we don't recreate the wheel uh, so this is this is kind of getting us into what you already mentioned this theological interpretation of scripture right where where this is kind of a contemporary movement. I don't know how long, how old it is, but, and, it, and it's defined by different practitioners in different ways. And you've got Roman Catholics and you've got Protestants and, you know, all that stuff. But, but basically what they're trying to recognize is that we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of the postmodern uh, reader response kind of theory. They went too far, but they, but they, they, they put their finger on something. We aren't blank slates when we come to anything, okay? We bring things with us that help us interpret the real world out there or the texts that we're looking at, including the Bible. So why don't we find the best uh, assumptions to bring with us in terms of interpreting Scripture? Yeah. And so yeah. they, went and they, they go another step, and they said, look, there's promises in scripture that the spirit of Christ would be with the people of Christ throughout the history of the church of Christ to help them interpret the word of Christ. So there's this, there's this tradition of teaching. So they said, well, instead of taking my own assumptions, my private ones that I think work, uh, why don't I humble myself and realize God has been helping teachers of, of the text throughout the history of the church and there seems to be um, a general consensus uh, among the great minds, especially in creedal and confessional forms. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Why don't I just use those? Now, of course, if you end up studying the Bible and think they got it wrong, then on your personal level, you'd have to disagree with them. I get that. So, so, so that's what theological interpret. One of the things theological interpretation of scripture seeks to do is 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 take theology with us to interpret the Bible. Now, at first, that sounds odd. But, for instance, one of the things they argue, or some of them argue, is that the first thing we need to do when we approach Scripture is ask the question, what is it? What is this thing that's mm. in front of me? Yeah. You know, that's a question of ontology. Um, it is the written word of God brought uh, to men through writing prophets and apostles there was a time when it was not though it contains truths that are eternal it in its written form is not eternal it's actually a creature <clears throat> brought to man through the meticulous providence of god so it has an ontology came into being it exists brought into being by god and the next question they asked is well why so what it's the written word of God. Why? And that's a question of end or goal or teleology. And so if you read the whole Bible, asking the question, why do we even have a Bible? The answer is, in older language, to bring us back to God. Hmm. Okay? Redemption. Uh, which, which brings up the next question is, how does the Bible go about taking man to that end? communion with god it does it through a, a narrative uh, which ends up narrating creation fall and then the plan and purpose of redemption and the unfolding of it so those three questions are i think somewhat typical for uh, theological interpretation of scripture what is it um why do we have it and how does it go about trying to get us to that end and if you bring those three things with you to in any and every text, you're bringing theology grounded in the written word of God itself. You're bringing theology to the text to help you understand the text. And personally, uh, I think that's a good move. Yeah, right. I agree. <laughs> I see 
what make what jumps out at me, I guess, with this is that a lot of people would would turn around and say that that is wrong, obviously. And I think that is, like you said, it's a kind of a modernistic mindset. And uh, if you guys are watching or you're listening, uh, I do have an episode that did not too long ago, uh, I guess last season, with Dr. Craig Carter on you know the Great Tradition and uh, retrieving like pre-modern exegesis, and some of those things tie into this. So just if you're enjoying this conversation, just a quick note, you can jump back and yeah. listen to that one as well. Did you want to ask yeah, that? you know this this question of you know most people can say I I don't want to know what Barcellus thinks or the or the ecumenical creeds say I want to know what the author the human author of the biblical text meant well you, you can't get into his mind literally okay? right. he's dead <laughs> I think if you could get into let's say Paul's mind um, I think Paul would say what are you doing I left you a text. The, the the end product, the text, is inspired and therefore infallible. Go find out what God means by but you know by what I said there. So this whole question of getting into the human author's mind, a human authorial intent, is a really a modern thing. And I used to make a big deal about fighting against it. I don't anymore. If somebody wants to say, I want to get in a human author's mind, I ask them how. They say by the text. Oh, then I'll say, okay, great. That's that's what I think you should do. The text of scripture but what happens is we lose the text for the background okay right i was going to ask about this so i'm glad you're mentioning it the tendency to do that you know like uh, you're studying ephesians 6 and you want to know what the armor of god is and so so you study first century roman <laughs> yeah. you know, guard all right and you know there's a place for that but when it gets to the point where the people in the pew can't understand the Bible unless their pastor has studied first century archaeology, um, something seems to be wrong to, with, to me with that. Uh, then, 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 then yeah. the Bible ends up being placed in the hands of only only the experts, and uh, just a simpleton can't can't understand it. Now I understand mm -hmm. there's a place for second there's a place for secondary literature for background material, but somebody once said a good thing overdone can get undone and mm -hmm. I, I think that's sometimes what happens and it's all with this quest of trying to get in the human author's mind and so you get in the milieu the background you get in the worldview the politics the sociology you know whatever uh, of the first century in our in our illustration and and um, sometimes it's just a lecture in a in background sources and right. the pro one of the problems with background sources is like I was illustrating this recently, you know, uh, and this is a, this is just a, a made up illustration. OK, but suppose there's a kid in the Middle East and he goes in a cave. This, by the way, really happened. Um, but I'm. I'm kind of spicing it up. And changing things. <laughs> he finds this little jar and in the jar, there's a little rock and it looks like on this piece of rock, there's some script on it. So he takes it home to his dad and his dad says, whoa, I'm going to take this to the local university so he takes it to the local university an archaeological specialist in the whatever from fourth century archaeological specialist um gets it and says i've seen this before i've seen this this we'll just call it armenian script before mm -hmm. um we we need we need to confiscate this and we need to study it and so he studies it out and he, and he writes a paper on it said so, so he argues it comes from some armenian Christian, let's say, in, in the fourth century. <laughs> he writes an article. Well, he gets pushback on his article from his peers. You know, the article is read by 50 people in the whole world. Uh, but the 50 people that read it are all specialists in the same thing. And let's just say one of those specialists, 10 years after this little artifact was found, uh, found another one that discredits his this guy's initial article but the guy that wrote the initial article was asked by a bible dictionary editor to contribute an an, uh, uh, an article on ancient armenian christian you know language from the fourth century hmm. and he put his thesis in there and then subsequent to him somebody else proves it wrong and then it you know if you don't have the right source you don't know that and then you as a pastor you go read that and you tell your people a bunch of stuff and it's not true you know, it's just like, uh, to me, um, background, like the book of Ephesians, for instance, you can read the book of Acts, mm 
and get a whole lot of background to the book of Ephesians. Acts chapter 19 tells you a lot about it. And there's right. tons, I think, to learn from Acts 19 that, that illumines, that helps you understand some of the language uh, Paul uses. So again, all this came from a modern question. What did the human author intend by the words that he used? Uh, which isn't a horrible question, okay? I think it's just uh, overdone. Sure. Yeah, sure. So, and I think that, uh, so I guess that this kind of relates to something that I, I heard, and I'm taking pastoral theology right now at CBTS with Dr. Malone. And, uh, you know, he's talking about like some of the core of, of really what the pastor pastoral theology kind of revolves around is like a systematic theology, but the systematic theology that the Bible teaches. So would you say that when we're talking about theological interpretation of scripture, it's it's taking that systematic theology then, or trying to to figure out what the systematic theology that is presented by the whole of scripture, uh, and then, you know, reading the Bible back through that again? Again? Is that a good way yeah, to the, the theological interpretation of scripture, sometimes when you read definitions of it, it sounds like what we call biblical theology. Right. But it's more it's more than that. OK, they're not just saying, hey, we need to interpret texts in light of the history of redemption. They are saying that. But they're saying uh, we all have assumptions that have been traditioned down to us. So we need to try to work on our assumptions as well, our theological pre-commitments as we look at texts. So let's use the greatest minds in the history of the church and the greatest documents to help hedge us within you know orthodox bounds now here's an interesting thing you know when i use word tradition i didn't say tradition i said tradition which means passed down uh, the english language was traditioned to you somebody passed it down to you okay and they probably taught you some things that were wrong <laughs> some things that were right and then you went to school and they tried to you know rid you of all the wrong things and all that stuff well, if you use a dictionary to help you define words in the Bible, you know, somebody wants to say, it's just me and my Bible. and I don't know what a word means. I pull out a lexicon or a dictionary. Well, somebody wrote that lexicon and that person or dictionary was educated somewhere. And so the knowledge um, that they brought to their lexicon or dictionary was was traditioned down to them. Now, they could have gone to a Roman Catholic institution. They could have gone to a liberal Protestant institution. They could have gone to a fundamentalist. Hmm. And all three of those different schools would tradition a slightly different thing down to them. So if you want to say, well, it's just me and my Bible and I use a dictionary. Well, it's not that simple. Uh, that dictionary was traditioned is has all the marks of of uh, of human you know fingerprints on it and potential fallacies as well so the theological interpretation of scripture guys would say well then why don't we just go uh, you know have our bibles since we know we have assumptions try to use the ones that the Christian church throughout its history has identified as, a, you know, the core elements of what historic Christianity is. Sure. Then, you know, the Bible's a written word of God. God is one in essence, three in person, the incarnation, you know, things like that. The resurrection, I mm -hmm. would say, second coming judgment. Okay. So a question came in that I think is actually going to be really helpful for us to answer, because I think it'll lead us into the next part of the discussion that I wanted to uh, mentioned anyway. So the question was, how do we interpret the whole of scripture to get the systematic theology that we then use to interpret the whole of scripture? So he's pointing out that it seems like it, you know, you could make the argument that this is circular reasoning. Now, I think I know where you're going to go with this and talking about and talking about mirroring the hermeneutical moves the, of, of Christ and Paul and John and the apostles. But uh, and maybe maybe this is where you would go. Maybe that isn't. But um, do you want to speak to that yeah. a little bit? Try and answer that question. Yeah, well, sy systematic theology, technically speaking, isn't what the Bible presents to us. Right. I, I believe it is contained in the Bible, but systematic theology is man's way of trying to categorize truths, usually starting with the, the most foundational, either scripture or God, and then working from there, which is a very interesting and I think a right move um, because – 
after God, you have uh, creation, providence, fall, um, salvation, Christology, or Christology and salvation, ecclesiology and eschatology. But God is the agent who produces all those ultimately things. And so if you don't know who the agent is, uh, th then you're going to get his effects, his work wrong at some point. Hmm. You're going to mix uh, the economy, God's works outside of himself uh, with God himself, God in say. So that's why a good systematic theology starts with, usually starts with either scripture or God. Right. Um, so I would, I would like to redefine systematic theology as man's attempt to put the major categories of scriptural revelation in a logical order. Um, and then, um, and then we fill those things in as we study scripture, you know, uh, biblical theology seeks to explain scripture in terms of its historical unfolding. Mm -hmm. So that's slightly different. Um, it's not a, enemy of systematic theology it's a friend so it usually starts with you know creation fall redemption consummation or creation uh fall uh recreation and consummation or something like that so it's slightly different but each can contribute to the whole work of theology and then exegetical theology is just you know mining out the teachings of particular texts I think they all have to work in concert with each other. And I think that's where historical theology comes in as well, because you can learn a lot and you can be corrected a lot um, by doing good historical theology, which I, I would say should include for a pastor on a regular basis, uh, leaning on creeds and their own confession of faith and um, sermons and theological treaties, and of course, systematic theologies, and then treatments on doctrinal subjects. And uh, I even throw in, I even throw in a good hymnal, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. especially that has, especially that has older hymns, because you read the, the older hymns, they're doing stuff with metaphors in those hymns, that's coming from scripture, and requires a very distinct hermeneutic that's very foreign to at least what I was trained in. And it's fascinating because um, you can get, you know, somebody who disagrees with the hermeneutic of the hymn, but the pastor stands up on the Lord's Day and calls out the hymn number and his whole church sings a hymn that requires a different hermeneutic that he preaches with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, so then now with the idea of theological interpretation kind of stuck in our heads, how is that different than what we might call redemptive historical interpretation? You kind of hinted at some of those things, the difference between systematics and yeah. biblical theology. I think those are related, so I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yeah, yeah, so uh, biblical theology, it would simply defined with the Vossian uh, definition, uh, the, the study of the history of redemption. Redemptive historical interpretation refers to a method of interpretation with, with reference to particular texts. So we, we're in a text, uh, we're in, you know, Colossians 1, giving uh, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, who rescued us from the domain of darkness, who transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, you know, all that. So what we would do in our exegesis of that passage is look at its context. We would find that giving thanks is actually a fourth uh, participle in a series of par participles that's telling us what a life that pleases God looks like. Hmm. Okay, so we're doing our exegesis. We see that. Okay, here's the fourth participle. And then it has three modifiers under the Father, the Father who qualified us, the Father who uh, rescued us, the father who transferred us. Okay. And then those are modified by other words and all that stuff. So we would hopefully get out some, um, uh, good commentaries and probably read them after we diagrammed our text or however we're going to look at it, or outlined it. And with good commentaries, you'll find like GK Beals, hmm. he, he's got uh, just a juicy discussion on, the language Paul uses 
and the dependence of Paul on various places in the Old Testament, especially the book of Isaiah in what uh, the theologians in our day call second Exodus language, where the prophet, he's not the only one, the prophets often evoke the first Exodus in contexts where they're actually talking about the future. So you read Beale and he does that and you go, whoa, this language of qualifying us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light seems to reverberate something from the God's saving of ancient Israel from Egyptian bondage. Hmm. So he qualified us. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. Okay. So that, and then transferred us into the promised land, which typified ultimately the eternal state, the kingdom of his dear son. So if you're reading, he's not the only one that does this. You can read John Gill does it. Uh, Matthew Poole has some good stuff on this. Right. G.K. Beale, David Powell, I think his name has had some good stuff. So uh, good commentaries will try to dig deeper than just the words uh, on face value and ask, well, look at this series of words. These are divine actions in what we call Christian salvation that seem to find their redemptive historical tap roots prior to the application of redemption to the Colossians. Hmm. Yeah. And what you end up wondering is okay he's using exodus language the prophets spoke about an exodus that would come that would include benefits for both jews and greeks could the first exodus have been an act of god whereby he did something in space and time that actually sets the world up for a greater act of god uh you know ultimately through christ and of course, you know what Beale's answer is going to be. Of course, <laughs> of course, sure. And so, and, uh... so redemptive historical interpretation uh, mines out the particular text, Colossians one twelve through thirteen there, and then says, "Okay, have I heard something like this before? Have I seen th something like this before? Is this a a pattern that has a pre pattern, and it ends up being the anti pattern or anti type right. fulfillment?" Yeah. Uh, so that's what redemptive historical uh, interpretation tries to do. Put it within the context of the canonical redemptive historical scriptures. OK, cool. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, another place to go, I had that episode with Mitch Chase on topology and allegory. Or you can go and listen to Dr. Barcelos and Mitch Chase on the London Lyceum panel that they did a while back. Really helpful. Oh, you, you had as well. You had Mitch Chase on your show. I did. It was a really oh. fun episode. He's, he's a yeah, really he's, helpful uh, um, I've met him, yeah. but we're friends, but I'd like yeah. to meet him. So. Well, you should check it out. <laughs> so, yeah. so along with that, then to kind of continue on that same train of thought. Uh, so would you say that redemptive historical interpretation uh, part, uh, maybe, it, maybe an easy way for like a lay person to go into reading scripture and trying to have that sort of mindset is to just look for Christ. And I mean, you, you talk about, um, you know, the scope of scripture being like what all of scripture is pointing to being christ now, so do we read as our, as our redemptive historical interpretation just reading scriptures for that to that end or, or i guess it's broader than that and that you're looking for other themes but i mean and that those themes point themselves to christ uh, is that a good way of describing it maybe <laughs> yeah uh, oh boy okay so you know sometimes when the new testament cites or refers to uh the old testament mm -hmm. It's it's to it's to encourage the first century Christians um, to live a certain way. First Corinthians 10 does that in Romans 15, uh, three and four. I think Paul says whatever was written beforehand was written for our sakes that we might persevere. And so that that doesn't seem to be an explicitly Christ centered um redemption accomplished kind of stuff sure, yeah. that seems to be redemption applied namely mm -hmm. sanctification so so i think you know a good thing christ-centered hermeneutics can be overdone mm -hmm. uh, and therefore undone in some passages where you're trying to force uh, justification by faith in there and it's just not there 
the text dealing with sanctification and sometimes uses the Old Testament as either a good or a bad example of Christian ethics. So I think we need to be broader than just, uh, you know, the Christ centered thing, though. I think yeah. scripture is if you ask all the Bible writers, if we can put them together uh, in a room and said, OK, here's a bullseye. Here's a target. Here's the center. And then there are all these if you look at a target, you know, there's a blue circle and then there's a red circle and then there's a yellow circle and they're getting larger uh, the farther out you get. And we, if we ask them the question, what is the bullseye? Uh, the old Latin is scopus. What is the scopus of scripture? The into which it all points. And I think they would say something like this, uh, the glory of God gain, uh, that is the fame of God uh, among creatures gained by virtue of what the triune god does through the incarnate son of god the skull crushing seed of the woman who became man for us and for our salvation to bring us to a glorious state of existence i i think that's what something like that is what they would call the scope of scripture and it's in all the old writings you know the glory of god and the redemptive work of the son of god to bring uh, many sons to glory hebrews 2 10 but that doesn't mean there are texts that uh, don't explicitly, excuse me, that doesn't mean that every single text to the same degree sure. points right to that bull, bullseye, and that's all it points to. Christ, mm -hmm. Christ, yeah. Christ. <laughs> you know, sometimes the old, the New Testament writers use the Old Testament for ethical, you know, encouragements. Right. And that, that's, that's fine. Sometimes the New Testament writers use the Old Testament um, to remind us of types that have their anti-types in Christ and his, and his church and, and the salvation that he brings. I, I think that's Paul in Colossians 1, 12, and 13. I think that's a great example of Paul doing that very thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the... Uh, which, is, which is interesting because, you know, this whole debate about typology. A type is a type when the Bible calls it a type. <laughs> well, then there, there'll only be like three types. Right, exactly. Like uh, Jonah's a type. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jonah's never called a type. Oh, true. So we Jonah get a sign of Jonah, but we don't, yeah, he's not called a type. So, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So, that's a good point. I mean, Adam's called a type, you know. Sure. Uh, and I think in Hebrews, the, the, the uh, ceremonial law, uh, it's called a type. But, mm -hmm. um, but, I, but if the Colossians 1, 12, and 13 example is right, I, I think we it's safe. We're on safe grounds to say even though that the Egyptian um, exodus or the ex <coughs> exodus from Egyptian bondage is not called a type anywhere, it does seem to be utilized by, by the way, more than just um, Paul in Colossians 1. Um I think John uses Exodus anti-typology, typology, typology uh, as well in the Gospel of John. But but if that is the case, then maybe a type can be a type without the Bible calling it a type because it meets all the you know the basic conditions of it. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh again that's a really good place to go back and listen to the other episode where we provide some of those definitions. Are going, I mean, I just picked up a new book by uh, Jim Hamilton on typology. So and there's lots of those coming out right now. Um, so. I'm, grateful for people doing that kind of work um, and grateful for yourself and, and helping with that as well. Well, okay. If I could take it one more direction before we wrap up here. Um, okay. So if you don't mind, if you, do you still have time? Yep. Cool. We've got about maybe 10 more minutes or so. Um, so the, the final thing that I kind of wanted to point out that I think uh, you, you really hit on a lot with in your course um, was just talking about Jesus and in the apostles um, as interpreters of scripture and and the way that a they would develop hermeneutics and that and that Jesus would eventually teach them after learning <laughs> um, how to interpret scripture, uh, and so the I guess the question that I'm getting at is is how do we replicate sort of the 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 kind I mean I think that's really what we've been talking about the entire time but how do we replicate the kinds of readings of scripture that Christ taught the apostles and that the apostles used? Well. Maybe the more basic question is, should we? Hmm. That's true. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and you you know that's a, temp, a, a contemporary hot potato. Should, right. Exactly. Should, we, <laughs> should we try to uh, 
imitate our Lord and the apostles in terms of how they interpreted scripture, which scripture for them would be the Old Testament. Right. You're, you're not inspired. You can't do that. <laughs> right. Well, you know, my come my cheeky come back to that is, OK, we can't use their principles, whatever they are, uh, because they were inspired. Who's not inspired in principles are you going to impose upon their texts? Hmm. Because it's either theirs or somebody else's. Yeah. And then, you know, some people might say, well, what are there? So it doesn't tell us. Well, it's not that simple. You got to do a lot of work. Okay. And GK Bill's done a lot of work on this. There's one of the articles. I don't know if you read it. I forgot the name of it. Um, where he, he basically lists like nine assumptions that he thinks the Jesus and the authors of the New Testament had to have in order for them to use the Old Testament the way they did. Hmm. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, um, article but you know i i wrote down excuse me earlier today when i printed out the outline for, for our discussion that i'm a red, red letter hermeneutic her, hermeneutician i don't even know if that's a word <laughs> hermeneutician it is now i like it but uh the older i get the more i think that you know what the incarnate son of god this side of the fall and the sin is the only very man on the earth without sin um and then even before adam because uh, or with adam before the fall and sin adam didn't have to interpret the bible okay mm, right <laughs> so here we have the sinless son of god uh in his earthly ministry and and by the time he comes on to his earthly ministry he's a lot like, like 30 years old but when he was 12 he was at the t temple wowing people with his knowledge right so that's 18 right. more years basically, give or take, uh, of him, uh, according to his human nature, developing wisdom because he, he grew in wisdom and stature among men. The skillful use of knowledge was something this weird for us to think about, but there's development in the human nature of our Lord. Physically, he started in a womb and then he ended up being a full upright man. Um, yeah. Mentally, uh, his, his mind developed, accumulated information. Um, by the time he comes on his earthly ministry, when he's 30, he knows all the theological hot potatoes. You know, it's like he's been looking at theological Twitter the whole time. <laughs> he knows how to punch, punch the buttons of the Pharisees. He addresses all the issues relevant, you know, theological issues of the days and all their faulty interpretation of the Old Testament. Now, um, somebody asked the question, well, how did he learn how to interpret the Old Testament? properly now i do not deny that during the state even of humiliation that there were special uh divine endowments upon the humanity of christ i think there were um, god doesn't tell us you know what those are but i think if you, we can argue that there were special endowments mm -hmm. uh, there's experience according to his very manhood uh, that we we can't experience uh, we have remaining corruption. The best of us are still sinners. Uh, he didn't experience that. Um, but by the time he starts his earthly ministry, it's clear how he interpreted himself in relation to the Old Testament. Both his person, who he was, and his work, what his vocation was, clearly rooted in the scriptures of the Old Testament. Right. So then we have to ask ourselves, did he? Did he impose on the Old Testament fresh hermeneutical moves hmm. to justify his person and work? Did he reinterpret it or did he interpret it? This is the divine intent of the Old Testament. The conclusion are the is the divine intent of the Old Testament, the conclusions that our Lord um concluded about him and his person and work sure hmm. was, it, was that was that what god ultimately always intended all along in other words um is christianity what we call christianity the natural and god intended result of what the old testament promised because that's the way Jesus viewed himself in relation to the Old Testament. The whole New mm -hmm. Testament 
is predicated upon our Lord's understanding of himself in light of what the Old Testament said and meant, I think, prior to his self-witness. His, our Lord's self-witness doesn't change the human or divine intent of the Old Testament. It expounds it. It explains it. But prior to his self-witness, it meant what it meant. When he says it meant what it meant. Mm-hmm. But it meant what it meant before he said it meant what it meant. Matter of fact, you can if you read the first chapter of Luke, you can see that there are Jews that have a messianic consciousness and expectation and it's not based on jesus interpretation of himself he's still an infant hmm. and it's, it's not based on reading paul or reading the book of acts they didn't exist right hey, paul even tells timothy that from childhood you know he was taught the holy taught, taught the sacred writings which are able to to give bring you the wisdom that leads to faith in christ jesus mm-hmm. so there is an apostle telling us that Timothy, when he was a child, this predates the writing of the New Testament, um, he could read the sacred scriptures and did, or at least he could be taught them when he was a child, and be led to faith in Christ, you know, the Christ that would come. Right. So that's why I'm a lead, red letter hermit, hermetician, because uh, Jesus' own uh, estimation of himself in relation to the Old Testament was assumed to be right by the writers of the New Testament, and they wrote in light of that. And by the way, Jesus' interpretation of himself as he related to the Old Testament in terms of his person and work changed the world, not only the first century, but it affects us every single day. We have this podcast because of the way our Lord saw himself in relation to the Old Testament. Yeah, and all the books you have. Yeah, right. Especially all the John Nolan back here. (laughs) Even the bad books you have. Yeah. That's funny. That's a good, that's an interesting way of putting that. Well, that's probably a good place to kind of land the plane then. Um, So any, any final thoughts, I guess, on things that we should keep in mind as we, as we read and read scripture um, using these sort of hermeneutical lenses, I suppose. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I've kidded with a friend of mine. I want to write a book someday called Lordship Hermeneutics. Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and I'll basically say, you know, Christianity is predicated upon whether or not Jesus was right about himself. <laughs> OK, yeah. we all assume he was. OK, how did he justify uh, saying what he said about himself? Well, he did it based on his understanding of the Old Testament. So someday maybe I'll do that. I don't know. I'm not getting any younger, so better hurry. <laughs> Well, I think those, uh, you know, that's why that Luke 24 passage is so, and we didn't even really mention it at the start of this, but the, even the very word hermeneutics coming out of that passage, mm-hmm. uh, but that Luke 24 passage of Jesus explaining to them all the places within scripture where, you know, it points to him. Um, I think that that's, you know, if we can get that in our heads, that this is, this is true and that Christ is the scopus scriptura. He is the scope of scripture. He's what we're looking for. Um, and, you know, that plays itself out in different ways as far as, like you said before, sanctification or uh, just like the narrative of redemption and things like that. But all of those things have a, a rooting in the 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 covenantal redemption work of Christ. Then I think we'll be in a good spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a fascinating passage, the Luke 24. Mm-hmm. If you read also in Acts 26 and 1 Peter uh, 1, 10 through 12, you'll see this motif of sufferings and glory Hmm. and all three in all four passages there's two in luke uh one says sufferings and then be raised on the third day and the other one says sufferings and glory but paul uses sufferings and glory peter uses in sufferings and glory and and our lord did luke does luke wrote the words there uh and they all say that motif of the messiah sufferings and then entering into glory by virtue of his resurrection on the third day, by the way, the third day resurrection, according to Paul, is according to scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, um, they they all ground it not in the words of Jesus, but in the Old Testament itself. Mm -hmm. And even in 1 Peter, there's there's reason to believe, especially if you read the older commentators, which I like better, um, 
there's reason to believe that the Old Testament prophets uh, knew they weren't writing their entirety to the entirety of their writings wasn't for the generation they were writing to or the people they were writing to, but it was with reference to a future generation. And it, it was about the sufferings and glory of Christ. And so Peter has the Old Testament prophets who, by the way, the prophets of Christ wrote about the sufferings of glory of Christ prior to the incarnation of Christ. Hmm. Yeah. And they were searching and making careful inquiry. Now you think about what is this? What are they searching? Their hearts? <laughs> Were they searching? You know, was Isaiah searching his own writing or Malachi was just searching Malachi? Right. Or could it be? And, and many in the contemporary uh, world, theological world, believe this, that there was a school of prophets, the writing prophets, that handed documents down to each other. And so that on a human level explains some of the same terminology used across, you know, the prophetic corpus. Sure. Uh, could it be that they're, they're studying other, they're studying Moses, right? Yeah. You know, a, a later point. prophet might have an earlier prophet's manuscript or something. Uh, I just put it out there asking, but, but <laughs> that's suffering and in glory in the Luke thing. You know, he says that, um, that, that sufferings and glory is rooted in the Old Testament, in Moses, the Psalms, and the writings, uh, Moses, uh, the, the prophets, and the writings. And then also the, uh, the proclamation of his name and repentance in his name, first in Jerusalem. So that, he says, is in the Old Testament, too. Hmm. But if you go to some of the prophetic oracles, especially in the book of Isaiah, they include light not only to the Jewish people, but re revelatory light coming to Gentiles as well. well. If you've ever thought of that motif in Paul, to the Jew first and then to the Greek, well, where does he get that? Did he make it up or did he read the book of Acts and saw, well, it started in Jerusalem, they started preaching, then they went out to the Gentiles? No, I think it's in the Old Testament as well. So anyway, we could keep yeah. going, but oh, we're not. Yeah. You said 10 minutes. I think we're up. Yep. We're, we're pretty much out of time, but uh, I appreciate okay. it. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Um, if it, if it's any encouragement to you in any way, I, I've become known in my church as like the Old Testament guy, mostly because I like to apply these kind of principles and talk about it. And people just haven't really been exposed to it before, I guess. And so at least not in the way that, uh, you know, you or I might uh, word some of the things that we, we we say and so uh i i appreciate the your work on all of this and i appreciate you coming on to the podcast yes sir well would you mind praying for us as we uh, close out sure lord we come to you sometimes um with more questions when we hear things and i certainly don't have all the answers none of us do we want to know your word because we know in knowing your word, we'll know you better. Please help us all, whether we're pastors or teachers or, or regular human, and bless this uh, discussion and cause anything that was wrong to be forgotten, anything that was right, burn it into our heads and hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, Dr. Barcelos. I'm very happy to have gotten you on gotten you on here and uh hopefully we'll get to speak with you again soon okay brother thanks for having me all right have a great one okay bye bye all right guys thanks for joining me on regenerated radio season what was it season three episode five i had a ride at the beginning of the episode i have to um i have to vamp here for a second because i keep ending the stream and then the audio like it, 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 i end the stream and we're done talking but i guess the latency messes it up and so i lose some of my audio at the end so i'm basically just vamping right now so you can go ahead and go away if you want to <laughs> uh, definitely hit like hit subscribe leave any comments that you like uh, i'll make sure that they get read i'm sorry i didn't get to answer everyone's questions uh we, we, you know dr barcelos had a lot to say and that was really helpful hopefully you guys enjoyed it i definitely did and uh that's all i got for now so i'm going to throw up a i need to put a stream ending thing Let's do this. I'm going to do it live on stream. Here we go. Properties.
stream ending. All right. So, see you later. Thanks for joining us. Have a good one.